let's look at some methods of analysis of publicly traded securities and eh, not just any particular publicly traded securities, maybe the whole market in general. Uh, we can perform a fundamental analysis, which is uh, the most common and the most widely used form of analysis, uh, an assessment of the short to long run prospects of different industries and different companies. Uh, we can look at uh, it from different levels, from the level of the economy, do an economic analysis, an industry analysis, maybe a competitive analysis, or run straight to a particular company and do a company analysis. And here we're looking to assess the impact uh, on the company's expected profitability of any kind of event well, from an economic perspective, recession, expansion, from an industry perspective, perhaps there's a, a, a massive change in structure going on, perhaps there's uh, a new technological innovation that's, uh, that's, that's sort of making the industry obsolete. The other form of analysis is technical analysis. It is the study of historical stock prices to identify recurring patterns. They're typically called chartists. Attempt to gauge the emotions and psychology of investors by drawing lines on a graph. And uh, we'll see some of this uh, uh, um, as we go on. Let's look at some uh, theories of the market, some market theories. The big one, and probably the most controversial one, is the efficient market hypothesis. Um, Stock prices fully reflect all available information and represents the best estimate of a stock's true value. Now, if we believe the efficient market hypothesis that the stock price fully reflects all the information and it's the best estimate of value, well, there's no point in doing any fundamental or technical analysis because we'll arrive at what the market's already arrived at. If the stock price fully reflects all information, why should I even bother looking at information? The... Uh, um, unsatisfying thing about the efficient market hypothesis is that if everyone believed that the market was efficient and that prices fully reflected all available information, no one would do any analysis and stock prices would no longer reflect all available information. Markets would no longer be efficient. The second theory we'll look at is called the random walk theory and there was a great book uh, on this one called A Random Walk Down Wall Street. I strongly recommend uh, that you read that one. Uh, random walk theory. Past price changes contain no useful information. What is this saying? Remember, technical analysis was the study of historical stock prices to identify patterns. Random walk theory is saying, hey, these past price changes, there's nothing there. Uh, so it's basically uh, saying technical analysis is useless. So the efficient market hypothesis says both fundamental and technical analysis is useless. Random walk is saying technical analysis is useless. Not looking good for the technical analysts so far. Information affecting price arrives randomly, thus price movements are random. And finally, we have rational expectations hypotheses. Past mistakes can be avoided, thus recurring patterns hold no information. So number three says technical analysis is useless. So of the three theories we've looked at, all three of them agree that technical analysis is useless, but only one, the efficient market hypothesis, is saying that fundamental analysis is also useless, but we found a contradiction there that if, we, if everyone believed that, then prices would be inefficient. In sum, it is unlikely that new information is available to everyone at the same time, so how, uh, if we look at the efficient market hypothesis, if this is true, if we believe this, well, then prices can't possibly reflect all available information because not everybody would act on that information. Uh, it is unlikely that all investors react immediately to all information in the same way. And it's unlikely that all investors make accurate forecasts and correct decisions. So if we think about uh, the market being efficient and we think about what that means, what efficiency means is that if, if the actions of buyers and sellers create prices, uh, we expect that on average, when the market is wrong, um, they're uh, uh, wrong, and let's say that this is the true price, P0, they're wrong on the upside just as often as they're wrong to the downside. In other words, they will overvalue stocks um, with the same frequency as they will undervalue stocks. A market is biased if it tends to consistently underprice assets or consistently overprice assets. Then we say a market is biased, uh, which means it's inefficient. But an efficient market doesn't mean it's a correct market. 
It just means that there is no bias to always being overvalued or always being undervalued. So even though we can accept these uh, statements, we can come to a conclusion that while markets may be efficient, that does not mean that they are correct. Prices can be incorrect, even though on average prices are efficient, individual uh, uh, securities can be mispriced. If we are engaging in, in a macroeconomic analysis, there are four, four categories uh, uh, that we have to look at. Number one, fiscal policy. Uh, fiscal policy is what your government does. Changes here uh, tend to work with a lag because they don't, they don't trickle through to the entire economy right away. So what, uh, what is the purview of fiscal policy? Taxation, spending, regulation and policies, and the level of debt. So let's look at taxation. Taxation can happen at the level of the household or the level of the firm. At the level of the household, higher rates or higher future rates will mean less disposable income. Disposable income is what we get to spend after the tax man takes their share. Lower rates, more spending power. So where are tax rates going? And uh, when we look at the distribution of income across the population, where we want to see the majority of tax cuts uh, is in the lower income brackets. In fact, I would say uh, in, in today's world, anything under 100000 uh, uh, household income, you'd like to see tax cuts at that level because they tend to be the spenders. They will spend every penny they make, uh, which means money turns over quicker. If you give uh, somebody who makes $500,000 a tax break, uh, they don't spend more, they just save more. So it doesn't actually have an impact on the economy. So uh, tax breaks should be given from the bottom up. Firms, higher rates, less business investment, uh, and lower dividends. I'm a firm believer that corporations should pay zero tax, and there should be no dividend tax credit whatsoever. All the income that investors make should be taxed at their marginal tax rate, but corporations pay zero tax. That would be a massive wealth creation tool uh, and a massive job creator. Um, you may have a different opinion on that. Spending, uh, that, can, that uh, uh, um, um, affects the G component of output. Uh, output is equal to consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. Well, there's G right there, right? More spending, higher GDP growth, uh, more job creation. Regulation and policies. And regulation and, and policies are really uh, intended to encourage desirable economic behavior. So a carbon tax is meant uh, to make people think about their carbon footprint or to switch to uh, less less uh, pollution intensive uh, um, forms of energy, solar or wind. It's meant to push an economy in a particular direction. And by doing that, by forcing an economy to to engage in uh, an investment in renewable uh, uh, sources of energy, it's a major job creator. But regulation can sometimes be a job killer, especially when you get to uh, really onerous uh, 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 labor laws. Uh, some countries, uh, like Germany, for example, make it very, very hard uh, for a profitable company to lay someone off or to fire someone. Makes it very hard. So companies are very reluctant to hire because of it. So job creation tends to be slower. Uh, and in recessions, well, there aren't that many job losses. But in expansions, there aren't that many jobs created. Whereas other countries say, well, companies can lay off whenever they want and hire whenever they want. So you have larger swings in unemployment, but in expansions, you have much more robust job creation. So regulation can help um, economic growth and regulation can hold back economic growth. And typically when regulation holds back economic growth, it's an unintended consequence. It was a regulation that wasn't thought through very well. And the level of debt. The percentage of tax revenues needed to pay interest and the level of interest rates. As interest rates go up, we have a large national debt. Uh, Ontario has a large provincial debt as well. So if interest rates go up, well, there'll be a larger percentage of tax revenues that are needed just to pay the interest, which may uh, be foreshadowing higher tax rates at both the uh, uh, household and the firm level which would only make things worse because you'd have consumers with less income to spend and you'd have businesses with less investment. 
Another uh, area to look at uh, in assessing macroeconomic uh, policy or macroeconomic analysis is monetary policy. This is the Bank of Canada. Changes in interest rates and money supply. Uh, for this, you want to watch what the Bank of Canada watches, which is inflation. And inflation tends to affect long-term interest rates. Uh, you want to anticipate the next policy action. Is the Bank of Canada going to raise rates, hold steady, or lower rates? And this will affect short rates. So you've got one eye on the long-term interest rates through inflation. You've got one eye on the short-term interest rates through the policy action. And you want to watch the bond market because the bond market is extremely interest rate and inflation sensitive. And people in that market have a, spend a lot of time analyzing what the prospects for interest rates and inflation are going to be. So where the bond market starts to move tends to give you a signal of where we think interest rates and inflation are going. And the bond market tends to be uh, uh, the first mover before the stock market does. And there's an expression that the smart money is in the bond market because the smart money tends to get it right. If you have long-term interest rates that are rising, um, you have competition with equities because you can make a nice yield on long-term on long-term rates the lower long-term rates are falling long rates less competition for equity so if long-term rates we're talking about 10 or 20 year bonds if they tend to be falling uh, well there's less yield available there that actually boosts the stock market so if we look at the yield curve over the past eight ten years where uh, 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 since the um, uh, financial crisis of 2008-2009 uh, the long end of the curve has been held very, very low. Uh, and when they're held very low, um, well, there's no yield. There's no yield, and long-term investors have to get a yield. Uh, so they have to step out on the risk curve, and that tends to support equity prices. Our third category to look at is something called the flow of funds. Uh, and this is the flow of funds between uh, the stock market and the bond market. Typically, uh, when investors are, uh, uh, investor confidence is high, uh, more investors uh, look to take on risk because without risk, there's no return. They look to take on risk. Money will leave the safety of the bond market and flow into the stock market. So you will have a, a, a bond prices dropping, which means yields are rising. You'll have bond prices dropping and uh, stock markets rising, typically. And uh, typically when money gets scared and when investors get worried about the state of affairs in the economy, uh, money will leave the stock market and enter the bond market because having money sit in cash makes no sense. It, it's always working. Money's always working. And the other thing you want to look at is the non-resident net investment in bonds and stocks. If we have interest rates in our country that are higher than interest rates in other countries, there will be a net inflow of investment uh, into our country to take advantage of the higher rates of return uh, just by buying uh, the bonds in, 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 in the market that offer higher rates. If our economy is expected to do much better than most other economies, well, then money will find its way into our stock market because our stock market should outperform other country stock markets. And finally, the inflation impact. Inflation lowers purchasing power, uh, lowers real interest rates, uh, it pushes nominal rates higher, uh, squeezes corporate profits, because uh, there's only so much that can be passed on before you can't raise your prices anymore. But inflation raises government revenue without raising tax rates, and you're probably wondering, how does it raise revenues without raising tax rates? Well, imagine something that's priced at $100 and you pay 13% HST on. Uh, you'll pay $113 for it. And let's say we have 4% inflation and that price now goes to $104. Well, uh, you're paying 13% on $104. Uh, so um, I put 113% here. Let me fix that up. That's $113. Uh, $13 of that is uh, tax. Over here, what are you paying? You're going to pay $113.52. Uh, so now the government is raising $13.52 just by uh, uh, inflation. <laughs>look at what's involved in an industry analysis and here we're really going to start with the structure of the industry because the structure of the industry tells us a lot about the potential profitability 
uh, within the industry. Industry structure will, will tell us about the prospects for growth. Here we can look at the industry life cycle, which we will shortly, uh, and the degree of risk. And we will look at Porter's Five Forces model to assess the degree of risk. Combining the two, uh, we can then say something about particular stocks depending on where in the life cycle they are and the type of industry, the level, the degree of risk in a particular industry. So let's uh, look at how we can do uh, an industry analysis. We can classify industries uh, by product or service. Uh, the economy, all economies, are broken down typically into broad sectors. Uh, you have things like uh, energy, utilities, uh, financials, telecom, consumer discretionary, consumer non-discretionary, and let's just take one sector here. Uh, each sector uh, is broken into multiple industries. So this is this arrow showing that this sector is broken into multiple industries, and let's just take one industry, this industry in the top corner, and each industry is broken down into multiple sub-industries. So when we want to analyze uh, the economy, we can analyze it at the level of the sector, a particular sector, let's say transportation. Or within transportation, we can look at over-the-road long haulers. And within over-the-road long haulers, you can look at a particular subsector uh, or sub-industry of that industry. Uh, and all of these uh, sectors, industries, and sub-industries all have a code. Uh, from GICS, the Global Industry Classification System, and they all have particular codes. So it's easy to find all the companies in a particular sub-industry. We simply just have to search for all the companies that have that GS, GICS number. Uh, we can look at things like industry sales growth, unit sales growth, or industry, industry price index versus the CPI, versus other industries, versus the sector, versus the overall economy. Um, Here's the reality of doing this kind of uh, research down here. It's, uh, it's not very likely uh, unless, uh, unless your organization has a, a well-funded research department because a lot of this stuff is going to cost money to get, especially at the level of, of the uh, industry. A lot of good sector information out there, but once you get into the industry and the sub-industry, a lot of that information is developed by research firms who then sell it. So unless you have a large enough firm that has a, a, a research department with a budget, you're not going to get numbers on industry sales growth or the industry price index versus uh, uh, that you can compare against CPI. But you can see that there's a lot of ways that you can, uh, that you can work um, just, from, uh, just from classifying industries by product or service. We can classify industry by stage of growth. And uh, here's a, what's called an industry life cycle. All industries sort of follow along uh, this, this trend. Uh, I plot industry revenue on the vertical. On the horizontal is just time. Uh, emerging growth, uh, which then becomes growth companies, which mature and maybe decline. Or uh, in, uh, in decline, they could also turn around and uh, hit another growth spurt. Emerging growth, these are pre-IPO, tend to be mostly private companies. They may be post-revenue, which means they have sales, but they're pre-profit. They're not profitable yet. Tend to have negative cash flow. Here, picking winners is highly speculative. Companies here typically have very high price risk, very high PE ratios, very high betas. In the growth stage, revenues and profits increase. Uh, we refer to the companies in this stage as growth stocks. Strong return on investment, improving gross margins. They rarely pay dividends, though, because they keep reinvesting back into growth because riding this curve is expensive. It costs money to grow. High price risk, not just over here. We have very high price risk. We dropped the very. We still have high. High price risk, high PE ratios, and high beta. In maturity, uh, the growth rate of companies tends to approach the growth rate of GDP. Stable revenue and profit, uh, more price competition, uh, tend to refer to these as income stocks because most of them have dividend payouts. Low price risk, low PE ratio, low betas. And then, of course, you have companies in decline where demand is declining. Uh, a company may be a target for a turnaround or distress. Uh, so you can classify different companies by the stage of growth that they happen to be in. Here is uh, Porter's Five Forces model. I tried to make it as easy uh, to understand as possible with some pink and, uh, pink and purple dots here. Uh, so we can classify industry by competitive forces, and this is Porter's uh, Five Forces model. And at the center of it all is the intensity of rivalry uh, within an industry. Uh, and the degree of profitability uh, w w in the industry is dictated 
by the interaction of these five events. So let's have a look at intensity of rivalry. We can describe industries as fragmented or as consolidated. A fragmented industry has a lot of players. It has a lot of small players that no one really can control the price. No one dominates. Uh, industries tend to be more profitable uh, the more fragmented they are. Consolidated markets are markets where you have two or three big players that pretty much control the market, referred to sometimes as oligopolistic or oligopoly. Um, here it's a little bit more difficult uh, uh, to compete uh, because to get a new customer, you almost have to steal it from somebody else. Uh, so um, it's, uh, uh, if we look at the, the um, automakers in, in North America, uh, a lot of competition between the three. Uh, so we would describe that as a very consolidated market. Let's look at home improvement. Uh, well, what have you got? Home Depot and Lowe's. Uh, and those are the two. You don't have all of the small shops anymore that could differentiate and compete on other, uh, on other um, uh, fronts. You go to Home Depot, you go to Lowe's, it's, uh, they're competing on two fronts. Uh, massive selection uh, and price. Uh, threat of new entrants. Is it easy to get into the industry? If it's easy to get into the industry, the industry will be less profitable because there's always that level of competition coming in. They may not stay very long, but while they're there, they take customers from other, other businesses. Uh, there's your restaurant industry. There's your nightclub industry. Uh, is it hard to get into the industry? If it's hard, it will be more profitable. Well, there's pharmaceuticals. Uh, very hard to get into that industry because you need millions of dollars in research and development to begin to develop a pipeline of drugs. And even if you start today uh, and, uh, and you spend three or four years developing a, a series of drugs, they've all got to go through testing, different phases of testing. You're 10 years before you're at market. Let's look at seller power, the sellers to a particular industry. If there are a few sellers to the industry, the sellers have power because everybody in the industry has to buy from just a few providers. So the, the sellers have a lot of power. If there are a few, it'll be less profitable because the sellers will extract most of the profitability. But if I'm in an industry where I need suppliers, and there are just hundreds of suppliers I can choose from, I got the power. I got buyer power because each supplier on their own hasn't got enough power. If there are many, uh, many uh, suppliers, the industry uh, will be more profitable. You can also uh, use the same logic with buyers. If an industry is selling to just a few buyers, now this is, uh, if you look in, in North America at the um, um, suppliers to the big three, uh, tool and dye, mold making, uh, plastic mold injection, there's hundreds of these uh, different firms, but who has the power here? Do the firms have the power or do the big three have the power? Uh, the buyers have most of the power. There are a few buyers. If there are a few buyers, you have an industry that's less profitable. If there are many buyers, you an industry that's more profitable. And the availability of substitutes. If the price of what uh, I'm, uh, I'm selling uh, is getting too high, can my customer switch easily? If they can switch, if there's a lot of substitutes, uh, you have an industry that is less profitable. If there are few substitutes, you have an industry that is more profitable. We can also uh, classify industries by stock characteristics. Uh, cyclical versus defensive versus speculative. Some industries are very cyclical, some are defensive, some are speculative. It's speculative emerging industries, some good defensive uh, uh, industry, utilities, non-discretionary, healthcare, uh, cyclical, commodity, basic cyclical, this is mining and forestry, industrial cyclical, this is transportation and steel, these are examples, and consumer cyclical, appliances, auto. We tend to buy these big durable goods in good times and in bad times those are the purchases that we say well you know what i got right now is going to work let's just stretch this uh, stretch this out so if we look at the return on equity uh for cyclical versus defensive and uh, um, we have uh, our plus and minus uh and we're going to map it over the business cycle for expansion and contraction uh, and this line here represents the business cycle. Look how pronounced it is, the return on equity is, uh, across the business cycle for cyclical companies. That's the nature of cyclical companies, is when things are doing well, they tend to really do well. Uh, and when the economy is doing poorly, they tend to do really poorly. But for defensive uh, uh, industries, uh, not so much. Uh, and some of them uh, really have positive ROE all through the cycle, things like utilities. Uh, and here's why. Uh, when the economy is, is really great uh, and you set your air conditioning, you set it at 72. 
uh, in a recession uh, and things are really bad, uh, where do you set your air conditioning? He said at 72. In good times, you may take a shower, two showers a day. In bad times, you take a shower, two showers a day. We don't shower more and turn the heat up just because we say, you know what, times are good. Turn that heat up and I'm going to take my fifth shower for the day. We don't use more utilities in good times than bad times. So utilities tend to be very defensive. The return on equity tends to be far more stable. Uh, it doesn't really accelerate in the good times, like cyclical industries, but you don't have that drop off in uh, recession. So what happens is as we enter into uh, expansionary periods in the economy, money flows out of defensive stocks and into cyclical stocks. Uh, and as we feel that we're turning over and heading into a, a recession, money will leave cyclical stocks and flow into defensive stocks. Okay, technical analysis. Uh, let's first of all make sure we're clear about what technical analysis is. For technical analysis, we don't look at any information about the industry. We don't look at any information about the company. In fact, a technical analyst will say, I don't even know, I don't even need to know the name of the company. I don't need to know the management. I don't need to know what they're selling. I don't need to know what country they're in. I don't need to know anything about the company. Don't say anything. Give me their chart over a period of time. Let me look at their, their, their price history and the volume. That's all I need. It is the study of past and present price action and trading volume. That's it. No income statements, no balance sheets, no assets, no sales reports, nothing. Just, just past and present price action. And they look for recurring and predictable patterns. They believe that because human nature uh, 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 repeats itself, human nature is patterned, and the stock market is nothing but a bunch of humans interacting and the price is the result of all that interaction, that the psychology of the market must show up in price action. That's the belief. They attempt to assess the mood or psychology of the market. And they make three assumptions. Number one, all influences are in the price. So they are inferring some sort of market efficiency here by saying that all influences are in the price. Two, prices move in trends that persist. Hence the, uh, the saying, the trend is your friend. Prices move in trends that persist. So they're looking at the random walk theory and they're saying, you know, get out of the room. You don't make any sense, this randomness idea. No, there are trends that persist. There's, it's not random. And the future uh, repeats the past. So that if we look at the past and we look at certain events in the past that, that uh, draw out certain patterns on a chart because of a certain event, and we see a, a certain pattern starting to form now, we may say, aha, it's the same thing happening again. This is what's going to happen to the price because this is what happened the last time we saw this particular pattern. And their, their basis for that is this, behavior tends to be consistent over time. Now, this statement here, do you believe that statement? Do you believe that um, you do not learn from your past mistakes, that you simply repeat them over and over and over again? I'm sure we all know people like that. Uh, but when money is on the line, do you think that that is what you do? When your job is on the line, do you think that that is what you do? Are organizations, financial organizations, so myopic and so focused on the short term that they fail to learn from past mistakes? You have to make a big assumption. Uh, that behavior tends to be consistent over time. But those are the three assumptions. All right, let's contrast fundamental and technical analysis here. Fundamental analysis, we're looking for over or undervalued stocks. We will buy undervalued stocks and sell overvalued stocks. Fundamental analysis will tell us what to buy and sell and the causes of value. What drives the valuation of a particular company? Technical analysis looks for rising or falling price patterns not over undervalued stocks, rising or falling price patterns. They'll buy rising patterns and sell falling price patterns. Technical analysis will tell somebody when to buy or sell. Not necessarily what, but when to buy or sell. And they don't look at what causes the valuation, they just look at the effects of value in the chart. All right, let's look at the tool of the technical analyst, the chart. 
and we'll look at a, a couple of patterns here and we'll look at uh, some some kind of charts that are useful this is uh, called an open high low close chart and it's uh, just typically uh, written open high low close so if you see OHLC that's what this is I've gone ahead and I put the open uh, in the in the charts this chart didn't have it it just had uh, uh, the high low and close typically the open uh, will be on this side of the bar the close will be on this side so wherever the tick is is where the stock open this is the high of the day this is the low of the day this is the close and so we can spot a pattern and uh, if you uh, have the um, um, right kind of charting software you can uh, these will plot out green and red so that at a, at a glance uh, a green bar uh, would this would be a green bar notice that the close was higher than the open here the close was higher than the open that would be a green bar here the open was higher than the close that would be a red bar here this would be a green bar this first one would be a red bar so you can see over time uh, when you look at a chart is there a predominance of green or a predominance of red so visually right away you can you can see the price action over a period of time in a chart just by the color of it and uh, these sort of give you some idea of what's going on now um, what these are useful for is let's say that we uh, see a stock that's been doing this we would say well that is a, a, a stock with a lot with with very low price variability from day to day but if we look at the bars we might find that they're doing this uh, uh, where they open here and they close here uh, and they uh, open here and they close here and they open here and they close here and they open here and they close here but the highs and the lows so in the daytime it's doing this it's hugely variable but for some reason over a period of time it tends to close pretty much near where it opens so that if we don't look at the intraday movements uh, uh, we get the idea that this is a, a stock with low price variability when in fact it may be a very very volatile stock so this gives us some idea of of uh, you know from a visual perspective if we have uh, more green than red we we can see that we have a rising stock Let's look at a, a couple of patterns, uh, and these are, I'll admit that these are, are pretty pretty uh, uh, important things to look at. Uh, sometimes you'll see a stock drop, and it'll just sort of go sideways for a while before it recovers an upward move. And if you draw a line, you'll find that a stock kind of bounces along a particular level, a, a particular price that it just, you know, will drop to, but ne never seems to get past and kind of find support there. Well, that's exactly what that line is called. It's called a support line. Uh, and what happens with the support line, the thinking is, from the technical analyst perspective, is when we see a stock drop and it finds support at a particular price, uh, investors are more comfortable placing buy orders at that point. So buy orders tend to cluster around the support line, thereby giving the support line the very support they think it's giving. Uh, so if you believe there's a line of support and you place your buy orders there, you actually create the line of support you believe was there that's the sort of thinking that uh, gets involved with technical analysis is that um, if people do believe there's a support line there they'll step in and buy there thereby making it the support line and it's the same with the resistance line a stock tends to rise and seems to have trouble breaking out over a certain new number it hits the, what's called this this line of resistance and that's what it is it's resistance well if you're a trader and you're seeing a stock bounce up against resistance you will put sell orders up here which means you'll you'll tend to buy at support and sell at resistance and if you're always selling at resistance every time the stock gets to resistance there's a whole bunch of sell orders uh, and if there's sell orders well to push up past the price you need buying activity not selling activity it thereby creates the very resistance that the market believed was in place to begin with so the idea behind the resistance and support lines is the longer uh, they're in existence the more and more valid uh, people think they are and the more and more that buy orders will be clustered at support lines and sell orders will be clustered at resistance lines uh, thereby making them uh, uh, much stronger support and resistance lines let's look at some reversal patterns here's uh, one called the head and shoulders which is a very popular one if you aren't quite sure why it's a head and shoulders let me just uh, do something here for you there you go so you can see there's the head and uh, the two shoulders um, this is called a reversal pattern. If you notice, the, the stock was rising into the left shoulder, then there was a pullback, and it found support, and then it rose again, broke out to a new high, but then retraced it all, found support again, 
rallied again, but just couldn't make it to the last high. In fact, the, 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 the third run up in price only made it to as uh, far as the left shoulder before it started dropping. When you see this pattern play out, uh, technical analysts believe, well, now what's happened is the price tried to go up. It couldn't do it. It's going to reverse. That's why it's called a reversal pattern. And once we see the two shoulders, we can draw the line of support. This line of support is now called the neckline. And if we want to know how far the stock is going to fall below the neckline, we take this distance and we say there's the price target down here. Uh, the stock will continue to drop till it hits the same distance from the neckline to the top of the head, from the neckline down. Uh, I don't really know about that, but there we go. The, uh, what adds validity to it is when we look at volume. Going into the price rise, the first price rise, we should see rising volume. And during the sell-off, we should see falling volume. During the next price rise, we should see volume rise above the last volume point. And then as it falls, we should get falling volume. And then on the third rise, you should hardly get any kind of rise in volume at all. That's showing that the conviction, the market conviction, is just not there. When volume, and when the price starts rising and the volume just doesn't follow along, uh, there's no conviction then you're going to have a reversal on this and as soon as it breaks the next line uh, then you typically have a run down to that uh, to that level. Uh, you can also have an inverse head and shoulders where uh, there's the one shoulder, there's the head, there's the other shoulder and we'll draw our little guy over here uh, smiling uh, and uh, the price has been falling and notice on the third drop down the price did not get uh, below the last point so we tend to have a, a what's called an upward sloping channel here and uh, that gives us a reversal here's our neckline our reverse neckline and it reverses so the price is dropped into the head and shoulders and reversed out here the price rose into the head and shoulders and reversed out reversal patterns Another form of technical analysis are sentiment indicators, and they're actually contrarian indicators. And uh, what a sentiment indicator does is this. If everyone is euphoric about the market, if everyone's bullish on the market, it's time to sell. Because if everyone's bullish, who's left to buy? And stock prices can only go up if buyers are going to come in the market. And if everyone's in, that's it. We're at a top because there's no one left to come in and buy. Uh, and when everyone's pessimistic and everyone tells you the, the market's going down and it's terrible, well, now it's time to buy because if everyone's saying that, who's left to sell? So that's the thinking behind it is that, well, let's listen to the crowd. If the crowd is cheering too loudly, uh, let's leave the party. Uh, so there's something called a bull bear ratio. Sell of the market is too bullish, buy of the market is too bearish. And there is a bull bear ratio that is produced by polling money managers and asking them how much money they have. Uh, um, just sitting on the sidelines waiting to do something. And the lower that level of money uh, is on the sidelines, the more bullish uh, that, that ratio gets because money has been found its way into the market. The more money there is sitting on the sidelines waiting to go to work, the more bearish uh, money managers are, it's time to buy. And the reasoning is, if they got all that money sitting on the sidelines and we buy now, that money has to come into the market at some point, it's going to push prices higher. When uh, conducting a company analysis, uh, the unit of our analysis uh, will primarily be, uh, or the focus of our analysis will primarily be the financial statements. Everything is in the financial statements or in the notes of the financial statements. And our driving question is this, is this a good investment? We're not asking if it's a good company, we're asking if it's a good investment. Those are, those are two separate statements. Uh, good companies do not necessarily make for good investments. A good company may be overvalued, and if it's overvalued, well, that's not really such a great thing. We would like to find companies that are undervalued, regardless of their good companies or average companies. So let's uh, let's have a look at the kind of questions we would ask to determine whether or not an investment is good. And we'll start with the income statement or the statement of comprehensive income. We know that it is uh, structured as revenues minus costs equal profit. So for revenues, what can we look at there? Well, we want to see that we have a trend of growing revenue over time. What rate is it growing at? And a big question is, why is it growing? Um, if it's growing just from price increases, the company has either stable volume or dropping volume, but it's raising its prices faster than its volume is dropping to appear that it has growing revenues, that's not a sustainable thing. 
Uh, is volume growing? Are they introducing new products? Are they entering new markets? Are they growing through acquisition? Uh, growing uh, with price increases and growing through acquisition, these are not sustainable strategies long term. We want to know if the growth rate and revenue is a trend which is sustainable or if it's just an event which is temporary. For costs, <clears throat> we have two types of costs. We have our cost of goods sold and we have our operating costs. We look at our cost of goods sold and we'll calculate a gross margin. The gross margin will tell us how efficient the company is in purchasing its raw materials or purchasing its inventory for sale. It will also tell us well, the type of competition pressure that it's facing. And our operating costs will tell us how efficiently it's running the business. And what we'd like to do is look at our gross margin or operating costs over time, all as a percentage of revenue. So we can look at SG&A uh, over time and if our revenues are increasing, we should expect the percentage of SG&A over time to decrease. That's called economies of scale. And then, of course, we look at our profit. The profit impacts our dividends. How much will dividends be? How stable are dividends? To uh, analyze or assess dividends, we can look at a dividend payout ratio. A company with a low payout ratio may be using buybacks instead. Instead of uh, issuing shares, it may, uh, uh, sorry, instead of issuing dividends on shares, it may be buying back its own shares. Uh, and when it buys back shares, it reduces the amount of shares that are outstanding so that your proportional ownership of the company increases. But it also increases uh, your earnings per share because there are fewer shares outstanding. Uh, and it drives up the price. There's demand. So buybacks are not bad. Buybacks are a good thing. A company that's maintaining a low dividend payout ratio may be using buybacks to return value to shareholders. If you have a high dividend payout ratio, do you have stable earnings? Can you afford that high dividend payout ratio? When we say high dividend payout ratio, we're talking about 70% of your earnings are paid out in dividends. Uh, do you have declining earnings and a high dividend payout ratio? As your dividend payout ratio goes from 70% of your earnings to 80% of your earnings to 90% of your earnings because your earnings are dropping but your dividend is stable, there comes a point where you're going to get a dividend cut. Uh, once you get to a point where you're 100% of your uh, earnings are uh, in dividend payouts, at some point there's going to be a dividend cut. All right, let's look at the balance sheet or the statement of financial position. And we can look at uh, two things here. Look at the capital structure, look at leverage. Capital structure, uh, you'll recall assets equal liabilities plus equity. So our assets can be financed with debt or with equity. Uh, for debt, uh, what is the quantity of debt that a company has? What's the maturity schedule of that debt? Uh, for equity, uh, are there any conversions? In the, equity, in the capital structure. Uh, convertible debt, convertible preferred share. Are there any warrants or rights that are outstanding that could potentially create more shares? And any new issues that are planned or do you anticipate any new issues on top of the current issue that's already uh, been, uh, um, been placed in the market? Leverage, if the capital structure contains debt or preferred shares, the company has leverage. And leverage is great on the upside, but it hurts on the downside. Um, the, the, an easy way to think about leverage is this. If you can borrow money at 3%, if you can borrow at 3% and you can invest uh, at 6%, should you do it? <clears throat> um, and the answer, most people would say, well, yeah, if you can borrow at 3%, borrow some money and invest it at 6%, you make 3% for free. The next question would be, well, how much should you borrow um, if you can uh, borrow at 3 and invest at 6 Um Borrow as much as they'll lend you it would be the uh, would be the answer. Now, as long as this investment continues to pay six percent, you're good. But if this investment is tied to the health of the economy, as the economy turns down, well, you're not getting six percent anymore. Uh, you might be getting zero percent or even negative uh, a negative percent, uh, but you still owe three percent. So on the way down, that leverage will destroy you. On the way up, that leverage is fantastic. So you can look at uh, earnings growth. Uh, and here uh, we'll, we'll uh, say that this is a, an economic expansion. Over here we have a recession. And uh, an unlevered company, which means it has no debt, uh, will see earnings growth in an expansion and will see earnings contraction in a recession. But a leveraged company that uses debt will see their earnings grow much faster because they're borrowing at a low rate and investing at a high rate. But in the expansion, when the investment doesn't return what it should, they still owe this money. Bang. Uh, their earnings take a big hit because you still got to pay that fixed cost interest, but your revenues are dropping. So this is um, um, such an important thing to know. Let's go through an example 
of a leveraged and a non-leveraged company and look at the impact on earnings uh, when uh, uh, when earnings uh, are on their bottom line when earnings change. So let's say company A and B, uh, total capitalization is a million dollars, which means they have a million dollars in assets. Company A finances the million dollars in assets all with just equity. So 100,000 shares at $10, raises equity, $1 million, no debt in the capital structure, so 0% leverage. Company B uh, finances the million by saying, well, we'll issue 50,000 shares, uh, common shares at $10, but we'll also issue 50,000 shares, uh, preferred shares at, uh, at $10 as well for the other half million. And uh, the preferred shares uh, carry a dividend of 5%. So we can say that they are 50% leveraged. And let's look at three scenarios here. Uh, year one, uh, earnings available for dividends, 50,000. Year two is 100,000. Year three is only 25,000. So we have variable earnings over three years. And we'll look at company A. Company A is no leverage, so preferred dividends are nil across the board. So uh, everything is available for common shareholders. The whole amount is. Um, this is the earnings per common share. All we do is we take the 50,000, divided by the number of, of shares, 100,000. We get 50 cents uh, uh, per share, a dollar per share, and uh, 25 cents per share. So the return earned on common shares, 5%, 10 percent, 2.5%. Uh, let's uh, look at company B under the same conditions, 50,000, 100,000, and 25,000 of earnings available for dividends. But you have this preferred dividend in here. Notice that it's a fixed amount every year, no matter what. Uh, so uh, what's available for common shareholders in the first year? Uh, 25, uh, 75 in the second, but nothing in the third. Uh, so what's available for common shareholder here? We have 50 cents, $1.50, and nothing. So you have 5%. At fifty thousand, they're 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 equal. Look what happens as the economy expands. Uh, company A went from fifty to one hundred thousand, but Company B went from fifty to one hundred thousand. Look what leverage will do: five percent to fifteen percent return for the common shareholders instead of just ten. But then the economy turns down from one hundred thousand to twenty-five thousand. Look what happens here: fifteen percent goes to zero, as opposed to two point five uh, for the common shareholders. So leverage is great on the way up. Uh, but it is poison on the way down. So some other aspects of analysis at the company level. Qualitative factors. Don't disregard this. The management team. Who are they? Are they effective? Brand reputation. Customer satisfaction. These are leading indicators of where a company is headed. Look at the liquidity of the shares. You're looking uh, uh, for it in terms of an investment. Well, can you get in and can you get out? Some investments, especially in the private sector, look really great. Uh, and it's easy to put your money in, but you have to think, well, hang on now. If I want to cash out at some future point, how am I going to do that? Uh, so uh, with liquidity of shares, you have to think about that as well, depending on the size of the position uh, that you're taking. Look at the average daily volume. If the average daily volume for a particular issue is less than 200000 you have low liquidity. If it's greater than 800000 you have good liquidity. Typically, common shares uh, will have liquidity uh, greater than 800000 Preferred shares are very, very low. So if you're thinking of uh, uh, adding preferred shares to a portfolio and you're thinking of adding a large number of preferred shares to a portfolio, uh, you may place a bid in the market and you may get it filled, you may get those shares. But if you ever have to sell those shares, uh, if the average uh, daily volume, and I've seen preferred shares where the average daily volume is uh, like 5,000 shares a, a day, and you have uh, 30,000 uh, shares to get rid of, um, you have six days of volume. It would take you six days to sell 30,000 and you'd own 100% of the volume. Uh, you're going to move the price, which means uh, if you can sell 1,000 to 1,500 shares a day, if the average daily volume is 5,000, uh, you're selling 1,000 to 1,500 shares a day without moving the price, without affecting the price. You got to think it's going to take you almost uh, 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 three weeks to a month to liquidate that position. Sometimes that's not good enough. So you got to you know, getting in is one thing, getting out is another. And then there's continuous monitoring. Uh, buy and hold is more like buy and homework. Just because you own a stock doesn't mean, well, you know what, I did the analysis four years ago, it was a good company, I'm done. Fortunes change, sometimes quarter by quarter. Accounting standards give companies a lot of flexibility in, in being able to report their revenues and their expenses and their profits in a way that is representative of the way they do business. Uh, so that not everybody has to follow the same rule uh, if, it, uh, if it does not represent how they do business. But the problem with that is now you can pick and choose policies 
that actually enhance your performance. That the numbers, the accounting choices that you choose actually uh, make your numbers perhaps look better than what they are. So when we look at financial statements, we don't say that we're reading financial statements. We say we're interpreting financial statements. We have to cut through all of that stuff and say, all right, now, the first thing I want to know is what assumptions have you made? What accounting policies are you going to use? Because those accounting policies may have an impact on how I understand your net income. So step number one, read the notes of the statements. Step number one, familiarize yourself with the accounting policies used. Management may select flattering policies, policies that enhance their net income. You want to look for changes in policies that uh, combined may decrease revenues and increase expenses. And you may say, well, hang on a second. What company would willingly want to decrease their revenues and increase their expenses? What company would want to show big losses? Ah, this is to springboard future earnings. Uh, so uh, it's typically done when a new CEO takes over a company. Uh, what it does is it say, the CEO says, look, I don't want to be responsible for all of these legacy costs. Uh, and I want great earnings going forward. I want to look like I saved the company. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to blame the past management guy on everything for everything. Sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to blame him for everything. I'm throwing everything out. I'm writing everything off. I'm shutting down things. I'm closing things off. I'm taking charges. I'm writing it off. We're going to show a big loss this year. But next year going forward, guess what? I have a clean uh, slate. I don't have a lot of legacy costs anymore. They're all gone. I blamed it on the other guy. I made the shareholders take a hit for the other guy. Going forward, my numbers are going to be great because I don't have all those costs going forward. So typically, uh, when a new CEO comes in, they tend to throw everything out. Um, look for policies that combined will increase revenues and decrease expenses. This is to make yourself look much better than what you are, called window dressing. If a firm can't make it with operations, they'll do it with accounting. That was Warren Buffett who said that. So, uh, you know, he's well aware of the fact that, hey, uh, just because they're reporting that nice big fat number, look at the accounting policies they're using, look at for changes in policies, are they getting more aggressive? Uh, look for the, uh, uh, look for M&A, mergers and acquisitions. Mergers are usually done out of weakness. Two companies will merge together. When you have two weak companies, they merge together looking for strength. Acquisitions, a company may be buying growth or adding to assets by overpaying. Remember when we overpay for a company, uh, the difference between what the fair market value of their net assets are and what we paid is called goodwill. That goodwill goes onto our balance sheet as an asset. Suddenly we look like we have a lot more assets than we normally have. So we can improve our balance sheet and increase our asset position simply by overpaying for acquisition targets. So let's look at a trend analysis here. And we're going to do it for earnings per share. We're going to do it for company A and uh, for company B. And all I want you to do uh, right now is pay attention to the first line here for earnings per share over this five-year period. And then look at company B's earnings per share over the five-year period. Um, which company uh, do you think uh, uh, it looks a little bit better, has a better trend? Here we have $1.18 to 132 increased to 173 kind of flatlined over to 176 and a small jump to 199 based on its earlier jumps, right? Uh, company B went from $0.71 cents to 80 to 90 dropped to 84 and then dropped to 78 So we can see that uh, we have, uh, in Company B, you have a declining trend over the last two years, but here it sort of rose, went sideways a bit, and rose a little bit more. Not very informative. We can't really see very much with this. So what we're going to do is we're going to put it into a trend uh, and uh, and create a trend line. And it's not, not difficult to do. What we'll do is we'll take our first year and we'll call that the anchor year. So in our first year, we made $1.18 and we'll divide it by our anchor year of $1.18. We get 100. Well, of course, we're multiplying that by 100. We get 100 as our trend. The next year, we take $1.32 and we still divide it by our base year of 118. In fact, we divide every year by our base year. We get 112, 147, 149, 169. So when we draw this out, uh, we can have our time year 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you know, 25, 50, 75, 100, 25, 50. You can actually draw out a trend over time of the earnings per share. As opposed to plotting the dollar value, you can actually plot the growth rate over time by keeping the base year in the denominator. We do the same thing down here. Notice that 71 cents becomes a denominator right across. 
but uh, the numerator is each year's uh, earnings per share. 100, 113, 127, 118, 110. So if you draw this out, uh, it looks something like that. Uh, so when you look at them this way, visually, looking at the trend, you can see a much clearer trend in each one as opposed to eyeballing the dollar amounts and trying to keep in your head what the, uh, what's going on there. The trend just cleans it up nicely. So with trend analysis, you can compare internally over time. So you can look uh, at this point and you can compare uh, the trend internally or you can compare externally over time. This is 100 versus 100. We went to 112 versus 113. So company B... Uh, from year one to year two, uh, did much better. Uh, they went to 113. Then we went from 112 to 147. While they increased from 80 to 90, we went from 132 to 173. It's hard to see in a relative way how much difference that is, but we can see it right here. We're at 127 versus 147. Then 149, you can see it's sort of flatline, fall to 118, fall to 110, while this is still continuing up. So you can compare externally over time. You can also compare with the industry average. Uh, the industry average does fluctuate over time because it's a relative measure. It's the industry average. Uh, it's better sometimes to compare it to an industry standard. The standard tends to remain relatively fixed over time. So it becomes more of an absolute measure. Let's look at ratio analysis. And uh, ratio analysis should be combined with some sort of trend analysis, looking at the evolution of the ratio over time. One ratio uh, has little meaning because you lack context. Let me give you a great example of, of what I mean by that. Let's say that uh, an individual, a, a man who's uh, 5 foot 10 inches, uh, and who is uh, 35, and goes to the doctor, steps on the scale, and weighs 285 pounds. Um, what would you say, what kind of advice would you give, uh, would you give that individual? Um, well, it's hard, to, it's hard to know what advice you would give. Uh, at 285, you'd want to know, well, hang on a second, uh, what did they weigh? Uh, and you look back over time, you saw the last time they were in the office, they weighed 315. The last time before that, they weighed 335. The last time before that, they weighed 385. And you look at that and you say, well, there's a trend. You're doing good. Keep it up. Whatever it is you're doing, you're doing well. But if the last time they were in, they weighed 250, and the last time before that, they weighed 225, and before that, they weighed 200, you got to sit that 285-pound person down and have a chat with them. Listen, whatever you're doing, it's not working for you. So without the background, um, those are two separate conversations you're having. One is positive reinforcement. You're doing a good job. Keep it up. The other one is, listen, you're on a bad road. Your heart can't handle this. So it's the same with the ratio. If you get to one ratio, well, what does it mean? You want to look at, well, how did we get to this ratio? What were the ratios in the previous three, four, five years before this? And is it a healthy trend or is it a bad trend? So you could take a ratio that on its own might not look good. But if it's been improving steadily for the last four years, bravo, the company's still improving and heading towards its goal. So let's look at the kind of ratios that we, uh, uh, we have here. We have four different categories of ratios, liquidity ratios. These measure the ability of a company to meet its short-term commitments, hence the word liquidity. We have risk analysis ratios, measures how well a company can handle its longer-term debt obligations. Operating performance ratios will measure profitability and efficiency, how efficiently it uses its assets. And value ratios measures what the company is worth, or actually more accurately, what investors think the company is worth. Uh, and different ratios are more critical depending on the industry. Some industries are very, very critical with operating performance, especially some efficiency ratios. You take retail and the inventory turnover ratio, that's a really critical one. But a financial services firm, inventory turnover has very little meaning. All right, let's start with liquidity ratios and look. And let's look at some very uh, popular and common uh, liquidity ratios. Working capital. This is nothing more than your current assets uh, minus your current liabilities. And it shouldn't be surprising that your working capital should be greater than zero. Your current ratio is your current assets divided by your current liabilities. And the standards usually say, well, anything more than two is pretty good. Anything more than five, uh, you might have an issue with inventory. Because I can always get a better current ratio by buying inventory that simply doesn't sell. Uh, well, that's not good. So the current ratio would say, hey, he's got a lot of current assets for every dollar in current liabilities. Yeah, but those current assets aren't selling. 
That inventory is not worth what it, what what it's listed at. So when the current ratio gets way too high, there there could be an issue. There, and I say it may be an issue, not that it will be an issue. It may uh, be an issue. To find out if it's an inventory issue, uh, we can move from a current ratio to a quick ratio, which really just takes inventory off the current assets and then divides it by the same level of current liabilities. If it's greater than one. Uh, uh, that's good, and uh, generally that's where we want to see it. If it's too high, that means we have too much idle cash. So if we had a very high current ratio, we might think we got an inventory problem. If we did the quick ratio, it was still a very high ratio. That means we're sitting on a lot of cash. And of course, on their own, these are really meaningless. We want to compare with industry standards or make a comparison over time. Compare with industry standards is external analysis. Comparing the ratio's evolution over time within the company, there's a trend analysis. Our second category, risk analysis ratios. And the first one is a big one, the asset coverage ratio. And it really isn't that bad. It looks messy. Uh, if you look at all the words down here, it looks kind of messy and complicated, but it's really quite simple. What we want to do is we want to calculate the dollar value of our net tangible assets. And we want to divide that by every $1,000 worth of debt. And why are we dividing it by thousand dollars worth of debt because the typical bond has a face value of one thousand dollars so we want to see how many dollars of net tangible assets we have backing every single bond so here's what we do we take our total assets and we minus goodwill why because we're only concerned with the tangible assets that's an intangible so total assets minus goodwill minus and we're going to take off our current liabilities except for the debt all the debt goes in the denominator so we want to make sure that our current liabilities reflect none of the short-term portion of debt. We want it all down here. And why are we taking off current liabilities? Because we want the net. So think about it this way. It's net assets that we're looking for, which is uh, our assets minus our liabilities without the debt. But we want tangible, so we'll take out the goodwill as well. So when you look at the, uh, uh, the numerator, what is it? It's total assets minus uh, all non-debt liability. So that's net assets take out the goodwill, that makes it net tangible assets, and we divide it by all the total debt outstanding, and all the total debt divided by 1,000 to get the number of bonds that we would have, and that's the same thing we have up here. So let's look at the interpretation of, uh, of the asset coverage ratio. Let's say that we calculate an asset coverage of 4,700. What does that mean? It means the company has $4,700 in net tangible assets backing every bond, every $1,000 worth of debt. Uh, also, pay attention uh, to this point here. Uh, the intangible assets uh, will most likely have value as well. So the $4,700 are assets that you can reach out and touch. They're tangible assets backing every debt. If you add the intangibles in, because there'll be some market value of the intangibles, it actually just improves. The debt equity ratio, this is our total debt outstanding. And if we've already calculated the asset coverage ratio, our denominator is total debt outstanding. So now it becomes the numerator and we divide it by equity. Uh, no liabilities, just total debt. So uh, sometimes you'll see the debt equity ratio is written as total liabilities over total equity. Technically that's wrong. It should just be total debt. Total debt over equity. Let's look at the interpretation of that. Let's say that we have a debt equity ratio of 1.6 and another one of 0.3. What does that mean? 1.6 means we have $1.60 of debt for every $1 of equity. 0.3 means we have 30 cents of debt for every dollar of equity. If it's too high, if our debt equity is too high, uh, well, there's credit risk simply because we have more debt. If you start getting to the point where you have $10 of debt for every dollar of equity, uh, you have a very high credit risk, very high default risk. If it's too low, we have an inefficient capital structure. We can always lower our cost of equity, or sorry, our cost of capital by introducing debt simply because debt, the interest on debt, is tax deductible, but dividends are not. And we would compare our debt equity ratios with industry standards. Our next ratio is cash flow to total debt outstanding. So there we are with the total debt in the denominator again. So we use once you calculate uh, the value of total debt, we find that we use them in a lot of different ratios in the risk analysis ratios. Cash flow to total debt, this is cash flow from operations divided by our total debt outstanding. Multiply by 100 to put it in a percentage form as opposed to a decimal form. So let's look at an interpretation of that. Let's say we have CFO over TDO, that's total debt outstanding, of 43%. That's saying the company can pay off 43% of its total debt in one year just from the cash flow from operations. 
So all of it, if, if all it did was took all of its cash flow from operations and piled it into debt repayment, it could pay off 43% of its debt per year. If you take one divided by the 0.43, uh, that means it would take 2.33 years to pay off all the debt just from operations. That's not bad. No selling of assets, just from operations, 2.33 years. The higher the better, clearly. Uh, if it were 100%, that would mean that the company could pay off 100% of its debt in one year. Interest coverage ratio, earnings before interest and taxes over interest expense. Why do we have it before interest and taxes? Well, we're trying to see how many times we can cover the interest expense. You wouldn't do that after interest, you'd do it before interest. And since interest is tax deductible, you'd also do it before tax. So let's look at an interpretation of this. Let's say we calculate an interest coverage ratio of nine times. That means the company has $9 in earnings for every $1 in interest, interest expense that it has to pay. Uh, here I make a point. EBIT is a before interest measure and all interest expense uh, 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 is included in the denominator simply because cross default may be an issue. So I'll explain that. Um, you wouldn't just include uh, the interest on a particular type of debt like uh, bonds for instance. If you have three or four different sources of debt you would include your interest expense on all the debt because most debt covenants have a provision in there called cross default. And what it's saying is, even if you pay us, but you fail to pay some other uh, uh, creditor somewhere else or some other uh, bondholder or debt holder somewhere else, you are deemed to have defaulted on us as well. And you're, in, you're deemed to, have be, to, to be in default across all debt issues. So that's why you include all interest expense, simply because each loan or each debt uh, a contract that you enter into probably has this cross default provision. And here again, the higher the better. All right, let's move on to the performance ratios. The gross profit margin. This is revenue minus cost of goods sold divided by revenue. Uh, it measures the efficiency in purchases and effectiveness with competition. An interpretation, let's say we have a gross profit margin of 40%. This means 40 cents of every dollar in revenue is available for operating costs and profit. Obviously, the higher the better, right? Net profit margin. This is our net income less any share of our net income that belongs to associates divided by our revenue. So if we have a net profit margin of 12%. This is saying that we have 12 cents of every dollar in revenue uh, available to equity holders. It measures the efficiency in the management of both operating costs and taxes. Return on common equity. This is our net income divided by total equity, or you may see it written as net income divided by shareholder equity. So let's say we have an ROE of 9%. We calculate that we get to 0.09 or 9%. This is the return to equity capital. That means that if you own the entire company based on the value of the equity, the income that the company generated is, is equivalent to a 9% return on your equity. It would be like holding a bond of that value and the bond has a 9% coupon. Our next performance ratio is an inventory turnover ratio. This is better described as an efficiency ratio as opposed to a performance uh, ratio. It is a performance because we're looking at the performance of our inventory, but it's more about the efficiency of our inventory. It is cost of goods sold divided by inventory. Uh, or cost of goods sold divided by average inventory. Typically when we have a numerator that has a number from an income statement, remember the income statement is for a period of time, so this would be considered a flow variable, but the balance sheet is at a point in time, so our denominator would be considered a stock variable. When we mix numbers from different statements, if you have a flow variable in your numerator, you want to use an average in your denominator if it comes from the balance sheet. That's why we'd use average inventory, which is just beginning inventory plus ending inventory divided by two, and just the average inventory for the period. This is really critical for retail. Retail needs to turn over its inventory. The faster it can turn it over, the better, uh, especially when it gets to uh, uh, things like clothing stores. Uh, where if you don't sell something by the end of the season, that's it. The value of that inventory drops dramatically. Really critical for uh, stores in consumer electronics or retail in consumer electronics. You have to move that product quickly. It depreciates almost on a daily basis. It measures the number of times inventory turns over or the number of times you can, can completely sell the amount of inventory you carry on average per year. 
So let's say the interpretation here, uh, we have an inventory turnover 12 times. That means inventory sells out or turns over roughly 12 times a year. Now, if that that's not really what happens. It's not as if a store uh, fills its shelf and by the end of the month there's nothing left and it replenishes on the first. It's always replenishing inventory. But it's equivalent to saying that it can completely sell out everything in its store 12 times a year. If we take 365 uh, days in the year and divide it by the inventory turnover, here we got 12 divided by 12, we get 30.5 days. That means on average we have 30.5 days of inventory on hand. That's the number of days of inventory on hand. If we have 30.5 days of inventory on hand, then we'll sell that inventory 12 times a year. The um, uh, uh, turnover ratio is industry specific. Uh, you need a very high inventory turnover for food or perishable goods. And you can live with a lower inventory turnover for things like heavy equipment, steel, wineries, etc. If your inventory turnover ratio is too high for the type of business that you're in, uh, you potentially uh, are running out of inventory all the time. You may have stockout problems on your shelves. Uh, if it's too low, uh, you may be sitting on a lot of unsaleable inventory, which might signal possible future write-downs. Our last category to look at are the value ratios. The first one, the dividend payout ratio. This is the common share dividends divided by net income. You can also, you could do it on an aggregate basis uh, where you add up the total value, uh, uh, the total dollar value of the dividends and divide it by the total uh, dollar value of net income. Multiplying it by 100 just gives us, uh, instead of a decimal, it gives us just a percent. Or you can use the dividends per share uh, divided by the earnings per share and you'll get the same number. So let's say that uh, we uh, do a calculation, we get the 32%. Uh, what does it mean? It's the percentage of earnings paid out as dividends. So for every dollar in net income, the company's paying out 32, uh, 32 cents. This measure is not really a useful measure. It's useful only for companies with stable earnings. Uh, it's the dividend payout ratio for most companies fluctuates every year. It's not a fixed number. There'll be a fixed dividend, but since net income fluctuates uh, over time, the dividend payout ratio fluctuates over time. There's not a lot of information there. A better measure is the dividend yield. This is the annual common share dividends, uh, or the annual uh, uh, dividends per share, uh, common share dividends per share, divided by the price per share that you pay, multiplied by 100 so we can get it into a percent. So this tells us that if we bought a stock at a particular price, the, just the dividend alone, what would it yield? So let's say uh, we have uh, a 46%, uh, sorry, 4.6%. There should be a little decimal in there, 4.6%. If you bought uh, at peanut, whatever the price is we use in the denominator, if you bought the stock at that price, just the dividend would yield 4.6%. That's not including any capital gains or losses that are considered. That's just, that's just an income yield, just the dividend yield. Equity value per common share. This is not very useful either. In other words, what we're uh, doing here is we're looking at something called the book value per share. It's just the value of our equity divided by the number of common shares outstanding. And we typically use just the ending share count here. And this tells us, based on uh, the balance sheet, uh, how much equity we have uh, per common share. How, many, how much of total assets are backing each common share. The problem is, is that a large portion of a company's uh, um, value is in its cash flow potential, not necessarily its assets. Uh, and assets are typically recorded at historical cost and depreciated towards zero. So companies uh, over time tend to have a book value per share uh, that if they're stable and they have depreciating assets will slowly grow towards zero, yet the company's worth significantly more. So the equity value per share, book value per share, this is really only useful when you get to a company whose assets are primarily financial liquid assets. So a, uh, a, a financial services firm, uh, an asset management company, banks perhaps. Uh, this is where it becomes far more important to look at book value per share. But for a manufacturing company, uh, book value per share is, is basically meaningless. The next measure we'll look at is earnings per share, EPS. And that is calculated as net income minus all preferred dividends because, well, preferred dividends are in line uh, for their share of the money before common shareholders are. And then we'll divide that by the weighted average number of shares outstanding. That will give us a measure called basic earnings per share. We can get to a measure 
called fully diluted earnings per share if we take all convertible securities, any convertible securities, any rights, any warrants, any options, and just assume they're all converted. We want to see how bad things are going to get. Let's say they're all converted. How many new shares would be created? And let's do this calculation again. Of course, we wouldn't be taking off any preferred dividends at that point because they'd be converted. If, if these preferred shares were convertible, then we eliminate this. But let's just say it isn't. We'd still have the same numerator, but we'd have more shares. So if a company earned $2 per share in basic earnings per share, the question is, well, what if all of, all of these di di uh, uh, convertible securities did actually convert? How bad would it get? And we find that it drops to $1.98. You think, oh, well, that's not so bad. I went from $2 to $1.98. Uh, it might be actually the same thing. Uh, that fully diluted shares uh, uh, earnings per share are equal to basic earnings per share because the company has no convertible securities. We just, again, the, the diluted earnings per share just gives us a worst case scenario on the potential dilution. So let's say a company has uh, $1.62. Does uh, the calculation we get to $1.62, what does it mean? It means that's the profit earned per average share outstanding. Price earnings ratio, PE. Here we take the stock price uh, on whatever day we're looking at it. We look at the stock price and we'll divide it by the earnings per share for the last trailing 12 months. So it's the market price divided by the trailing 12 month uh, EPS. On its own, it doesn't really tell us a lot. So we sort of have to compare it with other companies, uh, uh, especially in our own industry, uh, to get any kind of uh, feeling from it because it is a relative valuation tool. So let's look at company A and company B. Uh, let's look at earnings per share. Company A makes $1.63 per share. Company B makes $0.47 cents per share. On its own, that doesn't tell us a lot. Uh, let's look at the price. $20 for A, $3.50 for B. So we can see that uh, investors, if investors have, have the shares priced at $20, they're willing to pay 12.2 times earnings, 12.27 times earnings for Company A. But Company B is only selling at uh, 7.45 uh, times earnings. So in other words, we're paying $7.45 here for every dollar of earnings, but we're paying $12.27 here for every dollar of earnings. Uh, and to compare these two, they should be in the same industry to make the comparison sound. So if you just look at this over here, you would say, oh, Company A seems to be far more profitable than Company B. Company A is generating $1.63 uh, in earnings per share. Company B is only uh, generating $0.40. Cents. But how much are we willing to pay per dollar of earnings? That's what the P.E. ratio tells us. And it tells us that Company B is the better investment because we can buy every dollar of earnings for only $7.45, but we got to pay $12.27 for Company A. Uh, the P.E. Uh, 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 ratio can expand uh, in expansions. Uh, so if, uh, let's take uh, Company B at 7.45 times earnings, let's say that we're heading into an expansion, and it's still only making 47 cents per share, the market might be willing to pay more in good times for the same dollar in earnings. Uh, but typically what happens in expansions is the earnings per share go up, and the P.E. multiple goes up at the same time, so it really boosts stock prices. So let me give you an example here. Let's say we currently observe a stock with a P.E. of 12x. Uh, it has earnings per share of a dollar, so that means it must be selling at $12. And let's say that uh, over the course of the year, uh, uh, instead of a dollar per share, it's now making a dollar fifty per share. Uh, since it has a P.E. multiple of 12, 12 times a dollar fifty is $18. So it goes from $12 to $18 just on earnings per share alone. But if the market decides that, you know what, instead of trading at 12 times earnings, this company will start trading at 14 times earnings. Then you're not multiplying 12 by 150, you're multiplying 14 by 150, you get to 21. So you move from 18 to 21 just on multiple expansion, just on, on, on the market saying, we're willing to pay more uh, 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 per dollar of earnings than we were previously because the economy is doing better. So when stocks go up, they can go up because their earnings per share is going up and because their P.E. multiple is also expanding.